And here we are at Blue Rock Studios in, where are we? Wimberley. We just walked into this beautifully prepped studio that Keith has done. Thank you, Keith. You're welcome. Thank you very much. The circle's warming up in the piano. Ranch and studio. That's where we had a nice swim this afternoon. So there's a beautiful lookout around the edge of a ridge. I don't know if you can see it here, but downtown Wimberley. There's the rest of the porch. And this is where they have their uh, monthly house concerts. There's the stage. And this is the room. Backstage room, studio backstage area. There goes our star into the studio. Same old parts that um, that won't, you know, spit at you and last a, a good long time. So. He meticulously handcrafted those to the extreme detail mm -hmm. to the original mics. And, uh, Wonder Audio is the company, and uh, we love Austin them. Company. In Austin, yeah. yeah. Is he Dripping Springs or Austin or uh, Austin? Austin. All right. Hmm. He also made a U forty seven that uh, Billy acquired recently. That's uh, also just just stellar. And Will, why don't we show mm -hmm. where you were playing? Sure. So they can see this. Here, fill in this. Yeah. You mind? Mm -hmm. Thanks. <laughs> So you can see how on axis I was, right? <laughs> Playing over there. Oh, it's an item house. Sweet. It's from the 70s? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that's right. So that's pretty close. In Japan. when you mic it this way is you really want the you know the sound hole to be the same distance from both mics and check phase of course oh. between Are both the two. mics aim exactly the sound hole just one's up one's no, down no this one I kind of I kind of go for where the nail is going to hit the string I want as much of the clean attack as I can get so that's kind of what I focus this one on and this one just wants to hit down here in this area there's a really warm beautiful kind of stuff down there I will tell you this about Keith. When, whenever a guitarist is sitting here and Keith is miking, or whatever the instrument is, Keith will li listen first. He will put his head down there and see what the instrument is actually doing. Oh, yeah. yeah. He did that. I did do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and I've, I've always found out, who was it? Uh, I'll remember who taught me that. Someone that Bobby introduced me to. But, um, just move your ear around. Like, play, play a little bit for me. Well, and you'll hear the spot. It's like right there. And that's it's just, if, if it sounds good to your ear right there, it's going to sound good to the microphone right there. So that's, that's a big part of how I get my sounds, is listen to it in the room first. Just move it around because air is a really good EQ. And mic placement is my favorite EQ. Absolutely. So you don't have to use the EQ so later should, to that's fix right. it. Exactly. Fix it here. Exactly. Yeah. Is it a matched pair? It is. It's a matched pair of Sheps. Really good condensers. A lot of times, what I do if I if I have the the, the glory to do it, um, I'll put a pair of ribbons up, face coherent, and I have four faders, and uh, the ribbons give me something completely different. And I can, you know, the condensers are really picky and clean. For nylon, I always do just a pair of condensers. The ribbons are just too dark. But for a really bright steel string guitar, they can really tame the the strumming. So from song to song, like on Billy's record and Grace's record and Cliff's record and Beth's record that we just made, that I, every acoustic guitar had four mics on it, and I could, in every mix, 
blend nice. between the we condensers call it the and holy the ribbons. grail guitar mic setup Along with a room pair and a DI, so it was like seven tracks per, per guitar track, but um, you can do some amazing stuff with it. So, so what brand are those again? The These are Shep's microphones. They're very, very, very sensitive and, uh, you know, really low level detail. You know, I guess the diaphragms are just, they're just so well made that, uh, you know, they pick up all that low stuff. Low level stuff. When you when you say low, you mean low level, low dynamic, low dynamic, low, low frequency. The quietest stuff. You're really clean, really quiet mic to get all that detail at low level. Yeah, exactly. I've noticed that, uh, and I'm a piano player too, so you know I I've tried a lot of different miking, and I still I still experiment. You know. Do you I want to lay down a track? Try too? different. Yeah, there is. <laughs> and Come on, nah. you can do it. Nah. But the um, you know the shimmer of the the pedal. That felt stuff, condensers will pick that up in a way that ribbons don't. Ribbons have a have a real way of picking up the fundamental of the sound. So once I started putting ribbons on the top of the piano, hmm. I got a lot less of. Can you get that pedal noise out of there? Wow. I used to hear that a lot, and now I don't. And uh, another trick I'll do the holy grail of piano stuff is I'll put the sheps, put a pair like inside the holes, and then blend that with the Royers, and that gives me this really wooden sound. And just kind of evens it out. So, if you're doing like a solo project and you you have the luxury of, of using six mics on one instrument, <laughs> play around, you know. Yeah. You ever you ever mic a grand underneath? I do. On top of. I have I have put some uh, yeah I put here mic, underneath that. Like really, that does underneath. the same thing for me as putting uh, the mics in the holes. Yeah. It just gives me that wood, just that soundboard. So you get the wood from underneath. And Exactly. Yeah, and then again, a room pair is always is always welcome. Did, were you running a room today? I wasn't running or, a room yeah, today. Okay. Yeah. I'm glad. So that's and same thing. And uh, you know, y'all were looking at my chains in there, and Billy and I spent a day where we would run certain instruments just through different mic pre's and try. You know, so I've landed on chains just by experimenting, and I think that's how you that's how you develop your style, and that's how you know uh, uh, empirically that. You know what what you're doing is right, or you know what I mean. Try a bunch of different stuff and listen back to it, and decide. Oh, this one sounds better for this reason because of this. And then the more you accumulate that kind of knowledge, the more you know your tools, and the more you know what to use, when and where, and you have the confidence to get stuff done quickly. And I know you guys have heard this. Please, your clients. The most important piece of gear in any studio is your ears. <coughs> I totally agree with that. Oh. I, and your fingers. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was talking to Will earlier, and Will's done a lot of recording, you know, just by, you know, lots of musicians have to just learn how to record themselves. And we were talking earlier, and I was like, you just move stuff around and turn the knobs until it sounds good. You know, it's not always like that. Sometimes you're just bringing someone into the studio that you don't know. Um, but since, since we were used to being on stage together, um, we, we thought it would be better to do it in the same room, and I was feeling particularly um, warmed up today, and I, I didn't think I would screw up too badly, <laughs> so I felt, I mean, a lot of times I can't bear to, to track in the same room with the guitar, because, you know, I know it's a really hard song, or I, I, I probably won't be able to get to get through it all the mm -hmm. way mm -hmm. in the same take, mm -hmm. but um, I felt really good, good energy and good chemistry today on that mm -hmm. song. We've been playing it a lot. Yeah. Also, Steve, you know, Steve was just coming in and reading the chart. He, right. he didn't know the song. Right. So that was helpful for him to be able to work. Right. Well, I've yeah. found that live energy is really important. And the, the, the more I can stay away from the overdub situation of someone just staring at you, playing something over and over again and losing sight of it, when you have someone there to play with and communicate with, magic seems to happen more often than not. Well, also and the fact that when you off, when you were off the bat, this song was going to have time, you know, shifts like a classical piece, like a chamber music piece, where right. slow down, speed up. The being, there's, you, it's really hard to nail that when you're overdubbing. And so if I'm sitting, we're all sitting here, we have eye contact with each other. We right. sat, in, so we sat in a triangle. So I could see Will and Karen with just a little bit of eye shift, and they could see each other, and they could see me. And so I could read them all the time, like just with very subtle. Like I said, she said we're used to working together. I can tell by her breathing when she's going to speak. Yeah. And I can tell by watching Will's fingers, 
when he's going to play, and so nobody has to count me, and I'm just, you know, and, and I'm just... They we're only playing one instrument at a time, too. Yeah. I mean, right. And she, and she a lot of times, she plays mandolin or, a, or a guitar, guitar on the Guitar and so. sing at the same I, time. So if I just have to sing, then gee, I'd rather just do it live. I think the time is better. Um, you know, like I said earlier, when we're all in the same room, um, we also know that we have to get it. And, and with the right That's musicians, it. Right. it brings the group together it raises the bar. If you know, if you're all in separate rooms, mm -hmm. and you know that you can overdub this later, well, how do you think you're going to play? Mm -hmm. Compared to like bringing some players together that really can do it mm -hmm. and need to do it, so everybody commits at a different level. Including and the engineer it's and like, the producer. All right, and I'll still bring yeah. the same badass musicians together <laughs> to do an overdub project, mm -hmm. and what does it take? Like four times as long. <laughs> you, know, cause, yeah. you know, people are just not tuning in and focusing mm -hmm. as much. Mm -hmm. I mean, I personally think I play better, you know, having that pressure yeah. cooker. You know? Yeah. And in this situation, it was actually only two of us in the room because Steve was going. That's right. Was going to be direct. like it's honest. Yeah. yeah. Right. Right. That's exactly what I was going to say too. I love the yeah. I love the being put on the spot a little bit yeah. and having that edge. Yeah. Uh, I'll just throw a little interesting professional business story about that. Is a uh, heard from a friend who was the copyist on this gig. Uh, Barbara Streisand was doing a session with a 48 piece orchestra. And uh, she was so insistent on the live sound, the orchestra, was, she was like, they did some ri like ridiculous, like 43 takes, 43 takes with the whole orchestra. Wow. And they had to do it live, and they'd been there like eight hours, and they were like bitching, like, well, our take is perfect, can't she just overdub? And I said, Barbara didn't overdub. You're getting paid by the hour, what are you complaining about? You know? Yeah. But she, she would not overdub, she wanted the energy of everybody in the room, and so she, I think it was the Summer Wind wow. was the song. Wow. If you listen to it, it's just an absolutely gorgeous song, mm -hmm. and you can just hear this breathing live energy. Mm -hmm. But she would she wouldn't let anybody leave the room. So everybody had to be in there on the same time. And Frank Sinatra oh. was was uh, known for having an audience at all of his sessions. You know, just <laughs> and you know, had, had, honestly, yeah. honestly about the live thing, uh, I take a lot of over the years. I've taken a lot of long cross country drives, and I bring all my CDs and all my tapes, and I end up listening to the same seven or eight of them. I had to ask myself, <laughs> why do I listen to these same seven or eight all the time? And they were as varied as. Bob Marley, the Weather Report, to Joni Mitchell, the Pat Metheny Trio, and or Keith Jarrett, or whatever. And I realized they all record live, all at the same time in the room, which is why there's mistakes in the in the Bob Marley. The horn section is playing one chord, and the guitar is playing another chord. And I listen to the salsa bands, and they all record live, and the energy's there. But there's bad notes, there's missed notes, you know. And, energy's uh, better than perfection. Yeah. Energy is way better than perfection. Yeah, Absolutely. Miles Davis. If you yeah. listen to Miles Davis Trio, Quintet yeah. Live, they, they had a lot of, there's a lot of clams. But you know what? <laughs> everybody's in the room playing at once. We're in this crazy time in history where we have the opportunity for perfection. You know, and how much surgery do you want to do? I, you know, I mean, that's, right? That's the eternal yeah. question. Right. The balance between, right. you can, you know, and certain producers I've worked with go for the, I want it perfect. You know, like almost every single snare hit. Well, and, we're not out, no, didn't quite sound right. You know, and then and then you have this, you know, really surgically produced, sterile kind of perfection, and I, and on the one hand, because we can, that is possible. It's tempting to to kind of go for that, but then on the other side of it, you know, everyone agrees about the beauty of a live recording that has little little scratches or little whatever, and so sometimes it takes courage to say. Yeah, I'm going to commit to you know the feel and to, to do something that's 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 more real. And and even though it, there's this tempting thing, oh, I could lay over another track. Oh, I was a little out of tune on that one note. And I don't know. I I personally think that we it's we need to we need to champion yes. doing live recordings Bring it back. more because you know otherwise music just turns into you know, pure electronica. Well, the truth is, it's not just us. I mean, people who actually buy records and listen to them who are older than 15, <laughs> uh, they, they can tell. Record producers took them a long time to figure this out, but uh, they can tell the difference between an organic band and studio cats mm -hmm. and overdub. Uh, my favorite story on a local level is Christopher Cross. He had a little, uh, you guys remember him? <laughs> Sailing takes you away. He had a little rock and roll quartet, and they slugged it out in the trenches for 12 years, playing jingles and playing frat parties and bars, and then he got a hit record, and they'd been playing together so long, he had three number one songs on his first record. Three number one songs, and his album was number one for a while. That's almost unheard of. And his L.A. producers were like, great, great, okay, next album, well, you're going to come out to L.A., and you're going to use real session players now. You're going to use real, you know, the high-end L.A. cats. That's right. They came in, and they read charts, and 
the yeah. album tanked, you know, because there was no life force in the band, you know. Will and I have been yeah. together 25 years, and we make all these great live recordings, but we 